The Great Trouble, Mystery of London, the Blue Death, and a Boy Called Eel, by Deborah Hopkinson. Chapter 2, In Which I Save a Pathetic Creature. I stormed away, sweating, grimy, and wet. You might say I was mired in my own murky thoughts. Next thing I knew, I almost had my head taken off by something hurtling down from the sky, aimed right at me. Hello, eel, a voice called. Watch out. I jumped back. At first, I was afraid the stone arch above me had chosen this day to crumble into the river. Everyone knew Blackfire's Bridge wouldn't last much longer without repairs. But stones didn't screech like the ear-splitting sound that filled the air. Eo! Splash! For you, eel! I looked up. Only one mudlark had orange hair. What are you torturing now, Ned? Before me, the strange creature yowled again, making wild splashes as it struggled to stay afloat. All at once, it disappeared. The tide was coming up now, and I lunged, moving into the flow of the river. Let it be, why don't you? Ned hollered with cruel delight. Let's see if it can swim. I tried to scoop the creature out. It lashed at me, hard. Ouch, that was my arm. I almost left it to drown. I didn't fancy getting scratched to shreds and having my arms turn bright red from dirty wounds. Last winter, another mudlark, a lad of only eight, had nearly lost his foot after stepping on a piece of sharp glass. Then I remembered my old muslin bag, which I used for carrying odd bits of rope and pieces of coal. Maybe I could catch the creature in that. Come on now, I urged, slipping the bag off my shoulder and holding it out with both hands. At first, it splashed and squealed and fought something fierce. Couldn't get near it. Then it disappeared under the oily surface again. In a flash, I reached below and scooped the sodden creature up into my bag. Gotcha. Wading to the riverbank, I held the bag tight against my body and peered inside. A pair of bright green eyes, green as a queen's emeralds, stared back at me out of a mass of bedraggled black fur. I grinned. You fight hard for such a scrawny animal. Now be still and I'll rub you dry. You should be grateful I come along, came along when I did, little queenie. I looked up to see Ned still leaning over the side of the bridge. You are a nasty one. What do you want to do that for? Ah, uh, don't go soft on me, Eel. It was just a bit of mischief. A bit of mischief. I wondered what other mischief Ned had been up to lately. Maybe he'd been the one to betray me to Fisheye. Ned could probably be bought for the price of a cut meat pie or a pint of cider. In my arms, the tiny cat shivered. Then, as if suddenly realizing she was safe, she tried to bury herself into the crook of my elbow. Ah, little queenie, take my advice and don't trust boys or anyone, I told her, wrapping the bag around her more snugly and tucking her under my arm. Luckily, you're safe with me. I'm taking you back to the lion where you can start earning your keep catching rats. I felt one tickling my toes just the other night. For answer, she began to purr. On my way back to the lion, I passed through Covent Garden, where the flower sellers were just setting up their stalls. Clutches of girls were busy, were busy tying violets into bunches, laughing and gossiping as they worked. The streets were already a bustle of carts and wagons piled high with vegetables, chickens, peas, and fruit from the countryside. The smell of frying fish, potatoes, and onions drifted toward me, making my stomach growl. It brought me back to last winter, when just the smell of frying onions could make me almost faint with hunger. Then I relaxed and smiled a little. Those days were gone. I had a situation now, a good one. When I got back to Broad Street, I would have bread, cheese, and a cool dipper of good water waiting for me in my tiny corner in the cellar of the Lion Brewery. I moved quickly, my cap pulled low, my old shoes squelching on the cobblestones. I'd let my guard down these last few months since I'd come to the Lion. Jake's words were a warning. I needed to keep a sharp lookout from now on. Fisheye had spies everywhere, pickpockets mostly, and the gang of petty thieves who did his dirty work for him. He won't think to look for me on Broad Street or anywhere else near the Golden Square Park in Soho. I tried to convince myself as I headed north. Fish I didn't frequent that neighborhood too much. He would expect me to be keeping low in the crowded slums. We called them rookeries of South Wark, south of the river. And he won't find what I've hidden. I had to make sure of that. That's what mattered most. 
The little cat squirmed and clawed every time a horse neighed or a dog barked close by. Sometimes she held her tiny mouth on my arm and bit hard. Stop it or I'll let you down into the wheels of the next cart, I warned. But of course, I never would. I was about to cross Broad Street to the Lion Brewery when I spotted the white face of Mrs. Lewis staring up at me from the open window of her cellar. cellar. Hello, Mrs. Lewis. Baby wake you early? Before it was light. Poor Fanny, the wee thing has it coming out both ends. She nodded at the bucket she held, which she'd just finished dumping in the cesspool in the cellar. Through the window, I could see that the cesspool, that deep, smelly pit where all the chamber pots were emptied, was almost full. Time for the night soil men to come round and empty it. Thumbless Jake had told me he'd once done a stint as a night soil man. That life weren't for me, Eel, he said with a shake of his head. I heard of one poor lad who fell in a cesspool and couldn't get out. Nasty way to die, that was. Now I know this old river don't smell like roses, but at least out here I got the sky above me. Mrs. Lewis put her bucket down and sighed. If it keeps up, I might call round for the doctor. Dr. Snow, I asked. Her brows knit. I never heard of him. We call Dr. William Rogers when we need a doctor. Dr. Snow lives on Sackville Street. He's a smart one, Mrs. Lewis. I've been tending his animals all summer, I said, unable to keep the pride from my voice. He's what you call a real scientist. Does all sorts of experiments. You don't say. Dr. Snow has learned to put animals, and even people, to sleep for short periods of time with a special gas so as they won't feel pain, I explained. He made a grizzly bear that needed a tooth pulled go to sleep, and even eased the queen's pain when she gave birth to priest Prince Leopold last year. If he's doctor and giant grizzlies and Queen Victoria herself, he must be a clever one. She wiped her forehead with the tip of her apron and picked up her bucket. Well, I'd best be getting back upstairs before Fanny wakes. Give my regards to Constable Lewis, I said politely, and I hope Annie Ribbons don't get sick. Is that what you call my girl? Mrs. Lewis smiled. She do like to collect ribbons and threads, I'll say that. She's already a better seamstress than me, but goodness, you children and your nicknames. Seems like no child around the Golden Square ever gets called by his true name. Mrs. Lewis put a hand to her back as though it ached, which it probably did on account of the bucket she carried from the second floor down to the cellar. I've always been curious, Eel. What's your real name? I grinned. I'll never tell, Mrs. Lewis. And I wouldn't. Especially now that Fish Eye could be closing in on me. More than ever, I had to be like an eel. I said goodbye and turned on my heel to head across the street. Eel, watch where you're going, you clumsy lad. Flory Baker jumped aside, but I had to reach out and steady myself on the broad street pump to keep from sprawling to the cobblestones. I squeezed little Queenie tight to keep from dropping her. Sorry. I grinned into the second pair of green eyes I'd seen that morning, though I wasn't about to tell Flory Baker she had anything in common with a half-drowned cat. Not if I wanted to avoid getting knocked down for real. You're up early. Fetching water for your mom? That I am, she wrinkled her nose. You've been at the river, ain't you? You got the stink of the Thames about you. And whatever's making your bag wriggle like that. Just then, a freckle-faced boy came up behind Flory, leading a pony in a small cart. He stopped and cleared his throat. Begging your pardon, Flory. Can I have a turn at the pump? I need to get to Hampstead and back this morning. Go right ahead, Gus. Unless Eel here wants a turn first, said Flory. She picked up her bucket and moved aside. Not me. At the line, we get water delivered from the New River Company, and we have our own well, I said, pushing the cat more firmly under my arm so she wouldn't wriggle so much. Besides, I like the Warwick Street pump of water better. Can't say exactly why. Gus stepped up to fill his jug, not taking his eyes off Flory. I jabbed her in the ribs and whispered, One of your admirers? Flory giggled. Now don't you say anything against Gus. He's a steady boy, has a job as a runner at the at the Ely Brothers factory down the street, and thoughtful too, even brings me flowers sometimes. Flowers? Was Flory the sort of girl who liked flowers? The most I'd ever given her was a pencil. Flory stepped closer and tried to peer into my bag. Now let's see what you got in there. I opened the bag I peeled the bag open to reveal the little cat's wet head. Flory laughed. So are you rescuing kittens now, or is this creature for that famous Dr. Snow you're always going on about? Dr. Snow mostly takes me to a nice dog and rat for pictures, I told her. I need to raise little Queenie up as a rat or as a lion. I paused. Unless, that is, maybe you'd like her. Flory grinned. 
Our Jasper would claw her pretty face to pieces. Besides, we can't take on another mouth to feed, even a cat. Mom has her hands full trying to feed a family of five. I'm going to be helping Mom out, though, soon enough. She looks serious now. It's been settled. I'm to go into service in a fortnight. You are? But where? Worried you won't see me ever, she teased. Don't fret. I'll be working for a nice lady and her elderly father in North London, not too far away. Close enough to walk home on my half day off to see all my old friends. What will you do? Where do all girls start? I'm to be the scullery maid. But before long, mark my words, I'll be housemaid in charge of everything, she told me confidently. I'm 12 after all, 13 come next winter. Time I did my part. So, so I guess this means you'll leave the ragged school. I was lucky to go this long. Nancy only went to school till she was 10. She pulled a small dog-eared sketchbook from her pocket and giggled. I'll draw you pictures of all the fancy dishes the fine folks eat. I grinned, though I wondered if she'd have time for that. I'd seen scullery maids, their hands swollen and red from all that washing up. Maybe you can sketch little Queenie for me someday, once she's properly dried off, that is. I will, she promised, slipping her sketchbook back into her pocket. Across the way, the front door of the line opened. The business day was starting. I'd best get this little one something to nibble on before I start work, I told Flory. Don't want to be late or I'll catch trouble. Can I come feed Dr. Snow's animals with you today, she asked. I haven't seen them yet, and soon I won't have the chance. Meet me here later, I agreed. I can't go until I'm done with work at the line and sweeping up for Mr. Griggs. I swear, Eel, you're the busiest lad in Soho, said Flory. What do you do with all your extra tin? You certainly don't use it to buy clothes. Flory was my best friend, only friend, really. But I, haven't even I hadn't even told her why I needed money or why I didn't ever get clothes or treats for myself. Flory, here's something I would like to do with my money, I said suddenly. I'd like to buy you an Italian ice. The chance to see Flory Baker smile was definitely worth a penny.